To usher in the 1990s, Mike Tyson is the baddest man on the planet and ranked by The Ring magazine as the number one pound for pound fighter in the world. This will all change on February 11th, 1990 in Tokyo. After an emphatic 10 round beating, James Buster Douglas will land the punches to floor Tyson and end his reign as the number one pound for pound fighter in the world and heavyweight champion. Fortunately, at least for the sake of this video, just one month later, there will be a major showdown at Light Welterweight. Two unbeaten fighters will face off against each other in Julio Cesar Chavez and Meldrick Taylor. In undoubtedly the most brutal fight in this video, for the first nine rounds, Taylor's hand speed and skills will be too much for Chavez at all ranges. Late in the fight, however, Chavez showing an almost supernatural durability will start to turn it around. With time running out, Chavez will land right hands that will drop Taylor to the canvas. With only two seconds to go, referee Richard Steele will call a very controversial stoppage that will end the bout and install Chavez as the number one pound for pound fighter in the world. In April 1990, Michael Nunn was given what was seen as a chance to impress, facing off against former welterweight champion Marlon Starling. Though it was a decent performance, Starling was undersized and the win wasn't enough to display Chavez at the top of the pound for pound ranking. Also vying for the number one pound for pound spot in 1990 are Azuma Nelson and Pernell Whitaker. They will face off on May 19th, 1990. Through 12 rounds, Whitaker remains elusive and convincingly outboxes the hard punching Nelson. This fight lacks the drama of Taylor v Chavez though, and perhaps as a consequence, Whitaker is unable to replace Chavez at the top of the pound for pound round king. The other factor is that Nelson is a bit older and while still one of the best fighters in the world, isn't quite as close to Taylor. So this win perhaps isn't held in the same light. Chavez will spend much of the rest of 1990 fighting in Mexico against inexperienced opposition. He will round out the year with the win of a world title challenger, Kyung Duk An. Whitaker will up his excitement level rounding out the year with a first round KO. Michael Nunn will look impressive in finishing the year with a stoppage win over Donald Curry. The first bout of significance in the pound for pound race in 1991 will pitch the legend Sugar Ray Leonard against the Terry Norris who had finished 1990 just outside the pound for pound top 10. Early in the fight it becomes apparent that Norris has the edge in hand speed and power over the age legend. He will maintain his dominance throughout against the prideful Leonard who will refuse to quit. The next bout of significance will occur on May 10th, 1991. Pound for pound rank number three, Michael Nunn will square off against middleweight contender James Tony. For the first seven rounds, Nunn will have success outboxing Tony. Tony though shows good head movement and a solid chin to stay in the bout. By round eight, it appears Tony's slick economical head movement is starting to tire Nunn, who is connected with the air many times. In round 11, Tony goes in for the finish against an exhausted opponent, pulling off a huge upset. On July 27th, 1991, Pernell Whitaker will defend his undisputed world lightweight title against a mysterious unbeaten European challenger, Polly Diaz. To begin the fight, Diaz adopts an unusual style. He shirks away from any sense of the my turn, your turn that can sometimes happen in a professional boxing match and instead opts to hang way back before charging in with very aggressive flurries. Whitaker reacts with contempt, opting to stalk Diaz before power punching. Up to the fourth round, it appears Whitaker is struggling with Diaz's unconventional style. In the fifth round, Diaz's nervous energy begins to run out and Whitaker starts to administer a beating. He continues to batter Diaz through the late middle rounds. Going into the 10th, 11th and 12th, it seems Whitaker has done a great job against a very awkward opponent who is very game and committed. For some reason, through the 11th and 12th, rather than pursue an attainable stoppage, Whitaker opts to showboat and clown, 
at times getting caught with big shots from Diaz. It's a good performance, but the clowning at the end takes some of the shine off it, and it's not enough to threaten Chavez at the top of the pound for pound rankings. You may be wondering where does Roy Jones sit in all of this? On August 31st, 1991, he will stop a 12 wins and 16 losses at the time, Lester Yarbrough, in the eighth round. After the fight, Jones will say he felt sorry for his overmatched opponent, but nevertheless, mixing in such a caliber of opposition, he can't be considered in contention for the pound for pound top 10. In September 1991, Julio Cesar Chavez will make the second defense of the year of his WBC light world weight title against Lonnie Smith. Despite being beaten to the punch occasionally, the pressure attack of Chavez will win him most of the rounds, earning him a unanimous decision victory. Following on from his good wins at the end of 1990 and throughout 1991, Terry Norris will finish the year as pound for pound number three, with none dropping out of the rankings due to his loss to Tony. Whitaker's defences of his undisputed lightweight title will consolidate his status as the pound for pound number two. Chavez completes another year undefeated to top the rankings. Chavez will begin 92 with a defence of his WBC light welterweight title against Angel Hernandez. Despite some dirty tactics from Hernandez, Chavez won't let it get in his way and he will score a fifth round TKO. May 10th, 1992 will offer Meldrick Taylor a chance to once again threaten the pound for pound number one spot against Terry Norris. Since losing to Chavez, Taylor has moved up in weight to win a world title. He is now moving up again at to meet Norris at a catch weight. When the bout begins, Taylor wastes no time in going straight at Norris. As the bout progresses, Taylor takes no backward steps against Norris and gets drawn into an ill-advised firefight. In the fourth round, Norris' length, hand speed and power tells as he finishes Taylor. On July 18, 1992, Panel Whitaker will move up to light welterweight to challenge for the IBF light welterweight title, which Chavez had won against Meldrick Taylor and since vacated. His opponent, Rafael Pineda, is known for his punching power. In the first half of the fight, Whitaker will continue the pattern of recent bouts by moving less and power punching more. In the fifth round, he wobbles Pineda with the left hand. In the eighth round, he drops him with a body shot. In the second half of the fight, Whitaker will fight a more cautious fight en route to unanimous decision victory. On September 12, 1992, Chavez will face the WBO light welterweight champion Hector Camacho. Chavez will dominate throughout, doubling up on straight right hands and landing vicious left hooks to the body. Although he backs away and moves off a lot, Camacho hangs tough to go the 12 rounds despite taking a lot of punishment. On November 23, 1992, Oscar De La Hoya, Olympic gold medalist, will make his professional boxing debut. He would take an unusually brave move in taking an opponent with a 6-2 record. It will be the start of a pattern where he will not face a fighter with a losing or drawing record through his professional boxing career. To put that in perspective, earlier in the year, Panel Whitaker, as a consensus top three pound for pound fighter in the world, had faced a 12 wins and 13 losses opponent. And Julio Cesar Chavez, as a consensus top three pound for pound fighter in the world had faced an opponent with a 10-10 drawing record. During the bout itself, De La Hoya will impress with his punching power en route to scoring a first round TKO. At the end of 1992, Norris is ranked third, closely following Whitaker, who closely follows Chavez. On February 13, 1993, James Tony, who had gone an impressive 6-0-1 fighting regularly against world title challengers since beating Michael Nunn in mid-91, will move up to super middleweight to face defending champion around Barkley. 
In arguably the most impressive performance of his career up to this point, he will dominate Barkley at all ranges before Barkley retires between rounds in the ninth and 10th. One week later, Julio Cesar Chavez will meet Greg Hagen in a grudge match. In the run-up to the fight, Hagen had taunted Chavez, saying his 82-0 record was made up of Tijuana cab drivers and no hopers. The problem, as Hagen will find out, is that while Chavez has indeed faced opposition who would be ranked outside the top 200 today, he interspersed these tune-ups, facing the toughest champions in the sport across multiple weight divisions. In a sustained five-round beating, Chavez will punish Hagen for his words before stopping him in the fifth round after landing a big right hand. Two weeks later, Penel Whitaker will challenge for another world title at a new weight class. It will be pound for pound number two against pound for pound number five in Whitaker versus Buddy McGurk. For the first five rounds, the fight is close. In the fourth and fifth, McGurk has success with big right hands. By the sixth round, McGurk's work rate starts to drop off and Whitaker has success throughout landing a variety of left hands. Whitaker racks up the point through the late middle rounds. McGurk rallies in the eleventh round to pull one back. Going into the 12th round, it looks like McGurk, who is the larger man with good punching power, might try to bomb Whitaker out. Instead, Whitaker humiliates McGurk, dropping his hands to his waist to show his dominance and then landing barrages of punches that wobble McGurk. When the decision is read out, it's clear it's going to be an unanimous decision for Whitaker. On May 22nd, 1993, Roy Jones will take a major step up in competition as he faces off against future Hall of Famer Bernard Hopkins. It is important to consider that at this stage, Hopkins is a contender, but he will achieve far more than the expectation. Jones is a clear favourite going into the bout. The fight itself is an overly respectful affair, with Jones generally beating Hopkins to the punch at distance. Whilst it is the toughest fight of Jones' career so far, Hopkins is still refining his game and is unable to take Jones into the trenches. Jones will win a unanimous decision, but the match itself will slightly decrease his stock due to the low activity involved in the bout. On September 10th, 1993, it's the bout boxing purists have been craving. The enduring number two ranked pound for pound fighter in the world, Panel Whitaker, will face off against the number one pound for pound fighter, Julio Cesar Chavez. As the bout begins, it's immediately obvious the bout is going to be fiercely contested, with both fighters hitting on the break and hitting low. At the beginning of the bout, Whitaker begins to circle. This will be the first time since his bout with Azuma Nelson in 1990 that he will so heavily use lateral movement. Chavez is aggressive, looking to push the pace on Whitaker. After two even first rounds, in the third round, Whitaker begins to take over with his jab. In the fifth round, Chavez comes out with a great sense of urgency, landing a right hand and hooks to the body. The rest of the fifth round is more even than the third and fourth. In the sixth round, Whitaker finds a groove and starts to score points outboxing Chavez convincingly. Whitaker dominates Chavez on the inside and on the outside, landing his jab and left hand at distance and short tight punches on the inside. He appears to have the more economical style which allows him to outwork Chavez. Going into the late rounds, Whitaker only seems to get stronger, cementing his lead. Keen to avoid the same mistake as Meldrick Taylor, Whitaker stays out of trouble in the 12th round, but he can't completely resist showboating towards the end. When the judges' scores begin to be read out, and it's clear that it's some kind of split decision, Whitaker immediately spits on the floor. The official decision is two judges score it a draw and one has it for Whitaker, although most ringside observers have a clear Whitaker victory. In the final bout of pound for pound significance in 1993, 32 year old veteran Simon Brown faced 
pound for pound top three Terry Norris. Early in the bout, Norris imposed his usual hand speed and power. However, Brown appeared all too happy to engage in a slugfest. He landed power shots throughout round one and floored him with a jab at the end of the round. The power punching display continued throughout the bout, with Brown eventually flooring Norris again in the fourth round and stopping him. This would be the upset of the year that would remove Norris from the pound for pound top 10. After defeating Barkley, Tony will see out the rest of 93 winning against slightly weaker competition. Despite the official decision being declared a draw, most observers will see Whitaker as the real winner and he will replace Chavez as number one pound for pound. On January 29th, 1994, Pound for pound ranked number two Julio Cesar Chavez, who retained his WBC title in his paper draw with Whitaker, will square off against unheralded challenger Frankie Randall. In the first round, Randall shows slicker boxing skills than expected in taking the first round. In the second round, it looks like Randall might blow out a very flat Chavez there and then. Having found a groove, Randall pulls further ahead on points in the third round. Through the middle rounds, the fight becomes closer, with Chavez starting to pull rounds back and outwork Randall. In the seventh round, after taking a barrage of punches from Randall, Chavez hits low. Referee Richard Steele steps in and takes a point away from Chavez. This will give Randall a 10-8 round pulling him ahead on the scorecards. In the late rounds, the fighters split rounds 8 and 10, with round 9 going either way. In round 11, Chavez again hits Randall low, and referee Richard Steele again takes a point away. It's harsh in the sense that fighters sometimes get away with it, but at the same time he did hit him low, Later on in the 11th, Randall lands a stiff right hand at Dex Chavez for the first time in his career. With this now being a 10-7 round, it appears that this will be an unassailable lead for Chavez to pull back. When the judges' scores begin to be read out as a split decision, Randall looks petrified while Chavez doesn't look entirely too disappointed. Unlike Whitaker, Randall was nowhere near a superstar here, and a loss could easily have him fall back into obscurity at an advanced age. Luckily, the correct verdict is reached, with two judges scoring the fight in favour of Randall. On March 5th, 1994, Oscar De La Hoya will get his first chance to challenge for a world title in challenging Danish champion Jimmy Bredal for the intermittently recognised WBO super featherweight title. Showing an impressive display of punching power throughout, De La Hoya will drop his opponent in the 1st, 2nd and 10th rounds before the doctor calls a stoppage between rounds. On May 7th, 1994, Frankie Randall will defend his WBC light welterweight title against challenger Julio Cesar Chavez. Out to prove the apparent biggest upset since Tyson v Douglas was no fluke, Randall does a great job. In the second round, he badly hurts Chavez and nearly finishes him. Chavez shows a new angle to his game in bobbing and weaving on the ropes to survive. Throughout the rest of the contest, the fight is close, with Randall seemingly having a slight edge. In the eighth round, there is a clash of heads. Randall is automatically deducted a point, according to WBC rules. Unfortunately, as Chavez is unable to continue, the fight goes to a decision. When the judges' scorecards are read out, Chavez is controversially declared the winner. This is due in part to Randall having a point deducted for a low blow and an accidental headbutt. The point deduction for the accidental headbutt makes no sense in the context of an immediate stoppage. Nevertheless, with this injustice aside, Randall has consolidated his status as a top fighter with this performance. On September 17, 1994, hot prospect turned new world champion Felix Trinidad 
would face off against 56-0 Yori Boy Campus. Campus' record by numbers was inflated, but he hadn't fought too many fighters with a losing record. Showing tough Mexican spirit, Campus laid out his plan to block punches with his face and trade with Trinidad. He dropped him in the second round with a short left hook. Trinidad comes roaring back in the third and fourth, landing a barrage of sickening punches. Although Campos shows that he's incredibly tough, he looks a little bit short of skill at the elite world-class level. After a final barrage of punches, referee Richard Steele steps in, causing a stop to the contest at the end of round four. On October 1st, 1994, Penel Whitaker will defend his mythical pound-for-pound status and more directly his WBC welterweight title against the still highly regarded James Buddy McGurt in a rematch. In the run-up to the fight, McGurt will excuse his relatively close loss in the first fight, blaming a shoulder injury which he will substantiate by showing the scar tissue of where the injury occurred and surgery has been performed. In the second round, his excuse looks like it might be legitimate as he floors Whitaker. However, the replays show that he didn't land flush with the right hand and it was, in effect, a flash knockdown. From there on, Whitaker dominates, battering McGurk with left hands. Late in the fight, it verges on a stoppage several times. The end result is a clear unanimous decision victory for Whitaker. The final bout with pound for pound implications in 1994 is a big one. Number two ranked pound for pound and IBF super middleweight champion James Tony will defend his title against the moving up in weight Roy Jones Jr. Tony is considered a slight favourite, whilst Jones is still considered something of an unknown commodity. Prior to the fight, Tony causes a stir when he is revealed by the unofficial HBO scale to have rehydrated 18 pounds. Whilst the state of James Tony can be questioned, Jones' hands and foot speed simply cannot. After taking the first two rounds, Jones floors Tony in the third. Most ringside observers will be hard pushed to find a round that they can give to Tony throughout as Jones dominates. At the conclusion of 1994, Orlando Canizales is ranked number three pound for pound due to continued outstanding service in the bantamweight division. Roy Jones is ranked number two. Even though he beat Tony convincingly, there are still questions about Tony's preparation for that fight. He is also untested against the variety of competition that Tony faced. It's unclear, for instance, how he would fare against a rangy elite southpaw such as Michael Nunn. Whittaker's victory over McGurr in late 1994 consolidates his position as pound for pound number one. It's worth pointing out that not only is he tried and tested at an elite level against a variety of competition, but he's also winning fights fighting above his natural weight, searching for someone who can test him the best. On the 4th of March 1995, Panel Whitaker will defend his mythical pound-for-pound title when he moves up light middleweight to challenge WBA light middleweight champion Julio Cesar Vasquez. At this point, it's worth considering that Whitaker, by modern weight cutting standards, was never even that really big for lightweight. In the fight itself, a confident Whitaker controls the first two rounds with his jab. In the third and fourth, he stays in the pocket, and whilst not trading directly, he's playing a very close range, dangerous game. In the fourth, he gets caught torting Vasquez and dropped. He's not badly hurt, but it's a legitimate knockdown. The fighters split rounds 5 through 8. From the ninth round on, Whitaker appears the fresher fighter using more lateral movement and combinations. To add to Vasquez's problems on the scorecards, he's docked two points in the ninth and eleventh for a bleated blow to the back of the head. Whitaker ends up taking the title and consolidating his status as number one pound for pound. On 6th of May 1995, up-and-coming lightweights Oscar De La Hoya and Rafael Wallace will square off in a fight to unify their lightweight titles. Going into the fight, both fighters are known for a questionable chin and strong punching power. In one case, the chin issues will hold up, in the other they will prove to be a red herring. 
When the fight starts, Dorellas tries to force exchanges, winging punches, whilst De La Hoya nails him with straight punches down the middle. In the second round, Ruelas is again trying frantically to get inside. De La Hoya floors him with an uppercut left hook on go. He then drops him again before finishing him off with a combo that forces Richard Steele to step in. Roy Jones would take a step back in competition in 1995. One of his opponents was former lightweight and light middleweight champion Vinny Pazienza. Pazienza was a lightweight champion who was seen as having a very bright future until a broken neck seriously derailed his career. He has since gained a tremendous amount of muscle as part of his recovery and since during the reconstruction of his career. This fight would take place at super middleweight. During the fight, Jones reach advantage is very apparent. Pazienza is listed as 5'7", but that might be an inflated number. In the fourth round, Jones doesn't get hit once. In the sixth round, he finishes the job. In the final bout with pound for pound implications in 1995, undefeated lightweight champion Oscar De La Hoya will face off against undefeated super featherweight champion Genaro Hernandez. The announcement of this fight will raise eyebrows, as many believe Hernandez is a much better fighter than his drawing power would suggest. It's exactly the type of fight that taking will assert De La Hoya as a serious threat to the pound for pound crown rather than just a marketable fighter who can sell tickets. Through the first three rounds the fight is close with De La Hoya showing a new angle to his game in bobbing and weaving extensively. Hernandez will have success himself with a variety of skills. In the fourth round De La Hoya lands a brutal right uppercut that wobbles Hernandez. In the sixth round he connects with more uppercuts. Hernandez retires at the end of the 6th round. It will be later revealed that his nose was broken in 20 places. De La Hoya's form in 1995 will move him into 4th place in the pound for pound list. Ricardo Lopez is ranked number 3 on the pound for pound list at the end of 1995 due to his good form in the strawweight division. Although due to the lack of competition in the division it will be hard for him to threaten the number 1 spot. After catapulting himself to pound for pound number two with his win over Tony at the end of 94, Jones consolidates his position as pound for pound number two in 95. Whitaker has had another standout year in 95. After decisioning Vasquez, he will return to a welterweight to defend his title twice more to see out the year. On April 12th, 1996, Penel Whitaker will finally look human. He will face off against contender Wilfredo Rivera in a defence of his welterweight title. For the first three rounds, it will look like business as usual as Whitaker outboxes Rivera who uses an orthodox stance. In the third round, there is an accidental clash of heads which opens up a Rivera cut. To try to avoid Whitaker targeting the side of his head with a cut, Rivera switches to a southpaw stance. From the southpaw stance, he has success forcing exchanges and outboxing Whitaker. Whitaker allegedly had bronchitis in training for this fight, and as the rounds go on, this rumour starts to look like it might be more legitimate. Whitaker's cardio goes from looking like a weapon to a vulnerability overnight. Through the fight itself, Whitaker will throw 511 punches to Rivera's 686 and Whitaker will land 187 to Rivera's 193. The official decision is a split decision for Whitaker, and most ringsiders observers will think that it was very, very close. On June 7th, 1996, Oscar De La Hoya will move up to light welterweight to challenge a Julio Cesar Chavez, who has enjoyed a mini revival since his two performances against Frankie Randall. The fight is eagerly anticipated, but at 23 and 10 years younger than the 33-year-old Chavez, De La Hoya is a favourite. In the first round, De La Hoya opens up a huge cut on Chavez that immediately threatens to stop in the fight. In the fourth round, De La Hoya breaks Chavez's nose with a left hook, and in the midst of a very bloody scene, the referee has no choice but to call it off. On November 9th, 1996, former power for power number one Mike Tyson will face off against former undisputed cruiserweight 
and former undisputed heavyweight champion Evander Holyfield. Coming into the fight, Tyson had re-established himself as an elite fighter with his three-round destruction of Frank Bruno. Tyson was seen as a huge favourite with only a few detractors going into the fight. During the first few rounds, Tyson will have success. As the fight goes on, Holyfield will be able to impose his game plan of using footwork and distance and tying Tyson up in close. Holyfield will score a knockdown in the sixth round. Going into the late rounds, Tyson appears to fatigue and get frustrated as Holyfield takes over. Holyfield unloads on Tyson in the 10th, but Tyson survives. Holyfield finishes the job in the 11th round. On November 22nd, 1996, Roy Jones will attempt to be one of few fighters who have won three world titles in three weight divisions. He will face off against respected veteran Mike McCallum. McCallum is best known for his knockout wins over Julian Jackson and Donald Curry in his prime. He has a good jab and vicious right uppercut to the body. When the fight begins, Roy Jones' superior hand speed is immediately apparent. However, it's not all plain sailing as he starts to have problems with McCallum in the centre of the ring. McCallum also has success as he forces Jones back by scoring points, attacking his body against the ropes. In the fifth round, Jones wobbles McCallum and taunts his wobbly legs. In the middle rounds, Jones takes over. He knocks McCallum down towards the end of the tenth. The final two rounds will be controversial. Jones will say he intentionally carried McCallum well ahead on points. George Foreman and others will not believe this and claim that he just couldn't finish McCallum. Whitaker will see out 96 rematching Wilfredo Rivera. He will this time beat him convincingly but his performance in the first fight against the unknown challenger will cost him the pound for pound number one ranking. De La Hoya's win over Chavez and three world titles in three weight divisions move him up to number two on the pound for pound list. Roy Jones' biggest win is still James Tony at the end of 94, but he's had a good year in 96, stopping three legitimate world title challenges and winning a third world title against McCallum at the end of the year, which makes him the year end pound for pound number one. On January the 11th, 1997, Felix Trinidad will keep up his reputation for back and forth brawls. After a very inactive first round, he will get caught by a left hook from British fighter Kevin Lushing. He will return the favour, dropping him in the next round. After a second knockdown in the same round, the ref will call the fight. On March 21st, 1997, Roy Jones will make the first defence of his WBC light heavyweight title. His opponent, Montel Griffin, will be the toughest opponent he has faced since James Tony at the end of 1994. Through the first four rounds, Griffin seems to have learned from the success McCallum had against Jones. He uses a jab to score points in the middle of the ring, and as Jones backs off to the ropes, he scores points attacking the body of Jones. Although, as was the case with McCallum, Jones manages to block a lot of the body punches, but a few get through. Unlike McCallum, however, Griffin is able to threaten Jones more with power punches to the head. At the start of the third round, he catches Jones with a big left hook whilst he has his chin in the air. Towards the end of the fifth round, Jones connects with power punches himself. In the sixth round, they trade punches. Jones parodies wobbly legs, which seems counterproductive more than anything. In the sixth round, Jones starts clowning, but it looks more bizarre than directly effective. In the seventh round, Jones successfully uses feints to set up power punches. At the end of the seventh, in an awkward exchange of bodies, Jones lands a left hook that floors an off-balance Griffin. In the eighth round, perhaps feeling aggrieved from the circumstances surrounding his flash knockdown, Griffin body checks Jones to set up a left hand. It looks worse than it might be to some of the crowd who can't tell if Jones is pushed or punched and concussed with his nervous system short-circuited. Between rounds eight and nine, it's apparent Jones' eye is starting to swell. There's probably not enough time left for it to swell shut, but it can't fill him with confidence. Towards the end of the night, Jones lands a big right hand that staggers Griffin.
When he follows with punches, Griffin goes to one knee for an eight count. Jones pauses and follows up with a soft right hand before thinking about it and walloping him with a hard left hook. The referee has no choice but to disqualify Jones. With Jones slipping up against Montel Griffin, the pound for pound number one spot is now up for grabs. Fittingly, Penel Whitaker on Oscar De La Hoya, top three round pound for pound fighters, will face off a month later. This will be De La Hoya's first fight at welterweight and he again shows the desire to assert himself as a serious fighter by taking an awkward opponent like Whitaker, who is probably the toughest fight he could take. When the fight begins, in the first round, Whitaker wins the battle of footwork and the battle of the jabs. In the second round, De La Hoya focuses less on his own jab and has success with right hands. In the third round, there is an accidental clash of heads, which causes referee Mills Lane to deduct a point from Whitaker. The butt is called accidental, but as was the case earlier with Frankie Randall v Chavez too, under WBC rules after a headbutt, if a fighter is cut, the other fighter must be deducted a point. After a close fourth round, which Whitaker looked like he was edging, De La Hoya launches a very aggressive assault from a southpaw stance. Whitaker mimes being rocked. Replays will show that De La Hoya barely connected on any of the punches, but by Whitaker feigning being hurt, he really plays into De La Hoya's hands because it makes it very difficult for the judges to score. Through the middle rounds, they split rounds as De La Hoya switches stance for the first time in his career. Whitaker is more effective with the jab, but De La Hoya lands occasional power shots. In the ninth round, De La Hoya gets out of position after a 1-2 and Whitaker lands a counter left hand that floors De La Hoya. Going into the twelfth round, opinions are varied. Most observers' opinions range from a draw to Whitaker two or three points ahead. In the twelfth, De La Hoya hustles to take the round. The official decision is a unanimous decision for De La Hoya. In the post-fight interview, De La Hoya says he wants to rematch Whitaker. Whitaker says he won the fight hands down. My opinion is that Whitaker probably shaded it, but De La Hoya was the upwardly mobile fighter and would likely have won a rematch. When Tyson Holyfield first met in 1996, it seemed like it was Tyson who was a threat to the pound for pound number one rank. For the rematch in 1997, it is more likely that Holyfield can threaten the number one spot if he proves that the first fight wasn't a fluke. In the first round, Holyfield picks up where he left off. He clinches with Tyson in close and uses footwork at distance. At the end of the first round, Holyfield lands a huge right hand that wobbles Tyson. In the second round, there is a clash of heads that cuts and enrages Tyson. In a clinch in the third round, an enraged Tyson bites Holyfield. Referee Mills Lane deducts two points from Tyson. The fight continues for a bit until Tyson again bites Holyfield and the referee has no choice but to disqualify Tyson. On 7th of August 1997, Roy Jones will attempt to erase the memory of his controversial loss against Montel Griffin. He does so in spectacular fashion, knocking out Griffin in the first round with a looping left hook uppercut hybrid. On 17th of October 1997, Pernell Whitaker will try to re-establish himself as one of the best pound for pound fighters in the world. It starts to look like it's going to be a routine Whitaker victory by a wide points margin or a late stoppage. However, Whitaker starts to gas late in the fight. In the 11th round, he does some bizarre clowning on the ropes, which the ref scores a knockdown against Whitaker. Though Whitaker is initially declared a winner after the fight, the result is later turned into a no contest when Whitaker tests positive for cocaine. He will serve a ban before coming back to face Ike Quartet in 1998. When he applies for a boxing license, he will again test positive for cocaine and the fight will be called off. In December 1997, Oscar De La Hoya, who is coming off a 12 round thrashing of Hector Camacho, will face off against the Wilfredo Rivera who gave Pernell Whitaker all he could handle twice in 1996. In a dominant display, De La Hoya will drop Rivera at the end of the fourth round with a combo. Showing he has great power at welterweight, De La Hoya will wobble Rivera again in the eighth. The doctor steps in and ends the fight. 
By the end of 97, Whitaker slips to number four. Trinidad enters the top three for the first time. Roy Jones' controversial loss to Griffin bumps him down to number two. De La Hoya's five wins in 97, including the controversial win over Whitaker, make him the year-end number one. On 3rd of April 1998, in Bayamon, Puerto Rico, Felix Trinidad will defend his IBF waterweight title against challenger Mahen Zulu. He will show his awesome punching power once again, stopping Zulu in the fourth round with two left hooks. On 25th of April 1998, Roy Jones will once again show he is the best offensive fighter in 90s boxing. Facing off against world-class opponent Virgil Hill, for the first four rounds, Jones will repeatedly thread the eye of the needle, countering Hill's jab with right hands. In the fourth round, he will mix things up. Finding a gear nobody else in boxing has, he lands a body shot under Hill's jab, causing a broken rib and immediate KO. On September the 18th, 1998, Oscar De La Hoya will rematch Julio Cesar Chavez. Chavez has been unbeaten since his loss to De La Hoya in the first fight, but De La Hoya is a considerably bigger favourite this time. To the surprise of his detractors, Chavez will manage to draw De La Hoya into the trenches. In the eighth round, with De La Hoya's eyes swelling shut, he lands a horrific left uppercut that causes a brutal laceration on the inside of Chavez's mouth. Chavez is forced to retire between the 8th and the 9th round. On 19th of September 1998, Evander Holyfield will continue his winning ways. It's a lackluster performance with many critics believing Holyfield is saving his A-game for a showdown with Lennox Lewis. He knocks Bean down in the 10th, and edges out a unanimous decision. On 19th of September 1998, Floyd Mayweather will challenge for a world title for the first time. He will face Gennaro Hernandez, who has not lost since his defeat to Oscar De La Hoya and is undefeated generally at Super Featherweight. Through eight rounds, Mayweather will put on an impressive display. At this point, he self-describes as a boxer puncher, and in this fight, the description seems accurate. Through the fight, it seems Mayweather has even faster hands than De La Hoya, albeit he is punching one to three punches at a time, whereas De La Hoya can sometimes throw a five or six punch combo. After eight rounds, Hernandez's brother, Rudy Hernandez, steps in to stop the action. At the end of 98, Trinidad is in fourth place. Holyfield is ranked third. Roy Jones will be knocked down for the first time in his career in 98, although he will win the other 11 rounds against his opponent Lou Deval. The combination of the memory of his loss to Griffin and the knockdown put him in an upwardly mobile second place pound for pound. De La Hoya's brutal fight with Chavez consolidates his place as number one pound for pound fighter in the world by year end 98. In the first big fight of 1999, De La Hoya will face former WBA welterweight title holder Ike Quarte in a bout that was going to be a unification bout, but due to political reasons, only one title is up for grabs. After the fighters split the first five very even rounds, in the sixth round, fireworks fly. First, De La Hoya lands a left hook that floors Quarte, then later in the round, Quarte returns the favour, dropping De La Hoya. Through the late middle rounds, Quarte takes over with his jab and hammers De La Hoya with right hands. De La Hoya comes out with a rally in the 12th round. He again floors Quarte. De La Hoya goes in for the finish, but Quarte keeps throwing back and eventually De La Hoya punches himself out. When the decision is read out, it goes to De La Hoya. It is a very contentious decision. I would say about three-fifths, 60-70% had Quarte as the winner. One week later, Penel Whitaker will return to action against Felix Trinidad. As I mentioned before, Whitaker was scheduled to face Ike Quarte in 1998, but failed an announced non-randomised drug test that called the fight off. Going into the fight, it is unclear how well Whitaker will perform. Whitaker will be far less elusive in this fight than in previous fights. 
In the second round, Trinidad will land a right hand that floors Whitaker. Whitaker fires back with power shots himself, but Trinidad gets the better of it. Late in the fight, Trinidad verges on stopping Whitaker. Although Whitaker has landed power shots in one round, the final result is a big win for Trinidad as he damaged Whitaker far more than any of the other fighters have done during Whitaker's career. However, you have to put the poor performance in the context that Whitaker had a major cocaine issue just before the fight and he likely wasn't at his best. On 13th of March 1999, Evander Holyfield will face off against Lennox Lewis for the undisputed heavyweight title and in the case of Holyfield, as he was a former cruiserweight champion, a win here could potentially put him as the number one pound for pound fighter. After Lewis controls the first two rounds with a jab, in the third round Holyfield comes out with a surge of energy and tries to finish Lewis as his pre-fight prediction said he would. Holyfield wins the round, but Lewis survives. From there, Lewis controls the majority of the rest of the rounds outboxing Holyfield. When the decision is read out, it's read out as a draw, perplexing the majority of the audience who thought Lewis had clearly won on points. On the 5th of June 1999, with talk of a move to heavyweight on the cards, Roy Jones will defend his light heavyweight titles against Reggie Johnson. In an impressive display of power, he will show he has grown into his light heavyweight body. He drops Johnson in the first round with a right hand. He again lands a right hand that drops Johnson in the third round. For the rest of the fight, Joan wins every round before cruising to a unanimous decision victory. On 11th of September 1999, Floyd Mayweather will make the fourth defense of his super featherweight title. Taking on the dangerous puncher Carlos Serena, he will knock him down twice in the first round. From there he will continue to dominate before the doctor stops in at the end of the seventh round. On September 18, 1999, Oscar De La Hoya will face off against Felix Trinidad. Through the first nine rounds, De La Hoya will put on a boxing clinic, winning eight of the nine first rounds and dominating Trinidad. For the last three rounds, De La Hoya cruises, believing he's well ahead on points. Still in the last three rounds, Trinidad doesn't land much, if anything. When it goes to the judge's decision, to the prize of most, the Don King promoted fighter is declared the winner. With De La Hoya showing weaknesses against Trinidad and against Quarte, Trinidad overtakes De La Hoya with his impressive showing against Whitaker. With the memory of his win over Hernandez in late 98 and his continued good form in 1999, Floyd Mayweather moves out to number two pound for pound. Roy Jones will end 1999 as the number one pound for pound fighter in the world, with talk of a move to heavyweight on the cards. This year will conclude the decade and this will conclude my video. Thank you for watching.